This is the 17th in a series of lectures for students of MS 2014 and MS 3014 at University College Cork. In this lecture we'll look at quotient rings. All of our rings uh, from here on in will be commutative uh, with identity. Suppose that R is a ring and inside again commutative with identity and that I inside it is an ideal then um, we can pick an element, an R, R and R, and then we write R plus I to mean the set of all po possible values of R plus little i, such that little i is in big I. And it's called the translate, or the R translate of I. Um, so it's a similar to abstracted here algebra. Um, so let's just look at a simple example of constructing a translate if our ring is the integers and if our ideal inside that ring is the multiples of 12, 12 times any integer. So that means, of course, the set of numbers 12 times n such that n is any integer. Or another notation for that would be we put round brackets around the number 12 to mean the ideal generated by the number 12. So that's an example of an ideal inside this ring. And if we look at the translate 7 plus i, our definition in little r here is 7, then our definition is that's all the numbers that are, uh, that are an element in the ideal, so multiple of 12 plus 7. So it would be um, dot 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 uh, 7 minus 12, 7, 7 plus 12, 7 plus 2 times 12, and so on and so forth. So it's not a number, it's an infinite set. This set's a set of numbers in this case, and in general the translate of an ideal is, is, is a set of elements of the ring. It's a subset inside the ring. Um, in this case, this is a subset inside the integers, a set of integers consisting of all the integers that are 7 more than a multiple of 12. Note that we could also write exactly this guy as um, minus 5 plus i, because i is the multiples of 12, and you take 5 away from a multiple of 12, you always get uh, 7 plus a multiple of 12 and vice versa. So those are the same sets. But, um, um, maybe a simpler example would be if we just took, again, the ring to be the integers, and if we took i to be the set of even integers, and of course, that's the ideal generated by 2. Um, every even integer is a multiple of 2, so it's the ideal generated by 2. And then, um, then of course, we'd have two possible translates. We'd have the translate by 0, which is the even integers itself, just the ideal itself, and we'd have 1 plus it, uh, is, this is the odd integers. And those are the two translates of the even integers. You can translate them over by 1, pushing them all over by 1 you get the odd integers, or pushing them over by nothing you get the even integers. We, we always like to have some polynomial examples as well, so we could look at, um, as an example, we could take uh, our ring to be rational coefficient uh, polynomials in one variable, and then we could let the ideal i be the ideal generated by uh, the polynomial x. Um, so what does that mean? That it's all the multiples of x. In other words, it's all the, the polynomials that are x times some polynomial. Multiples of x. Multiples of x. Um, such that p of x could be any any polynomial from the rational polynomials over x. And another way, another way to describe this, this ideal is that this is the set of polynomials with zero uh, constant term because, um, because having a, a, a x multi, a, a divide into the polynomial means that it has, every term has a power of x in it. In other words, there's no constant term and a zero constant term. And similarly, we could look at a translate. If we look at a translate, a half plus x, that's the set of polynomials um, with one half constant term. So we've translated those polynomials over by adding a half to every one of them, move them over. Note that in general, if we took any ideal, we had always say, if we had any ideal in any ring, um, and we took an element of the ideal and then translated by it, 
it wouldn't do anything because adding an element of the ideal to every element of the ideal gives you just all the elements in the ideal. After all, everybody's already in there with it's all clo closed under sums, and so you just get the ideal back again. You can see that when you add something from the ideal to anything in the ideal, you get something in the ideal and containment that way. But everything in the ideal, when you take this away from it, gives you something in the ideal as well. So, uh, so you can see, just get you just get the same thing. So adding something from the ideal does nothing. Um, we can make a, an arithmetic of translates um, motivated maybe by our ex my favorite example about modding up by integers. Um, we could say that if we were to translate, um, uh, uh, well, maybe it's not really an example, just a, a, a general technique. If you take R1 and R2 in, the, in a ring, an arbitrary commutative ring with identity, and again, I is going to be an ideal, then you could simply define addition of translates by adding this translate to this translate to be defined to be this translate. Um, and and that is that we have to check that that's well defined. Um, but the proof that it's well defined is the same proof that we've seen in linear algebra for constructing quotient spaces of, uh, of vector spaces, or maybe you may have seen in group theory constructing quotients of groups. In other words, constructing quotients is almost always done the same way. And to check this as well to find, we just have to make sure that uh, what are the choices here? Because R1 plus I, as a set, it, it may may um, may give you the may have a different possible choices of R1 giving the same set. Remember that we said with minus uh, that with plus seven and minus five, when added to a certain ideal, gave the same set. And so you might choose R1 and R2, and I might choose S1 and S2. But as long as they give the same ideals in, as inputs, if R1 plus I uh, equals S1 plus I, and at the same time R2 plus I equals S2 plus I, if your choices and my choices give the same uh, translate, then they should have the same sum. To define a sum of translates, you have to make sure the sum depends only on the translates, not on how you choose to write them as, as a translate by this particular element. If we have two equal translates, and two other equal translates, then we should have equal sums if the sum is going to be well defined. You should be able to sum these two and get the, sum, the same sum as these two. And we have to check that that works. Um, so what we need to do though, and then is to say, well, if these are the same translate, what does that mean? It means that th this thing up to multiples of i is the same as this thing up to multiples of i. And so therefore, they must be equal up to multiples of i. That's exactly the same. In other words, it's saying that r1 equals s1 up to something. Yeah, let's say i1 in, so r1 equals s1 up to some i1 in i, and r2 equals s2 up to some i2 in i, and so um, r1 plus r2 is therefore equal to s1 plus i1 plus s2 plus i2 is s1 plus s2 up to something in i. And so uh, we can say that R1 plus R2 up to multiples of i plus any multiple of things in i is S1 plus S2 plus uh, any plus something in i, and vice versa. So um, so we see that these are the same translate, and that proves the translates uh, have a well-defined addition law on them, um, given by quotienting. We could say the usual addition law. Again, our a diff definition of addition is you get to uh, add translates by adding the representatives R1 and R2 that give you the translate, the things you translated by, um, and then taking the, that translate. And the same works for multiplication with the same proof. R1 plus I times R2 plus I is simply defined to be R1, R2 plus I. Now here's where we really use the fact that this isn't just a subring, it's actually an ideal. To make sure that this is well defined, we have to suppose that if I replace this guy by some S1 and they agree up to I1, and then if I replace this guy by some S2 and they agree up to I2, where they are, these are in, in the ideal I, then you multiply them and you get R1, R2 is S1 plus I1, S2 plus I2, and that, if you expand it out, um, is going to give you S1, S2, plus you get S1, I2, which is in I because I is an ideal. So we're using the fact that it's an ideal, plus S2, I1. And again, we're using the fact that it's an ideal, and uh, plus I1, I2. And again, using the fact that it's an ideal. And so, um, so, so all of this, all this is in I. Uh, 
and so we get that R1, R2 up to adding everything, every possible thing in I is equal to S1, S2 plus something in I, so just up to adding everything in I. Same translate. Okay, so we can see the multiplication is defined and the addition we already saw is defined. Similarly, we could see subtraction is defined by the same, the same, uh, um, the same steps for the addition. So this gives us a definition of the quotient ring. We simply define um, R mod I is defined to be the set of all um, translates R plus I of I for R in R. And uh, so it's all the translates. And we add and, and multiply in, the, in, this, in this way. This is called the quotient ring. And we use the fact that I was an ideal in order to make sure this really was a ring. To put a ring structure in the quotient, I can't just be any old thing. It has to actually be an ideal. Moreover, we then have an obvious, uh, an obvious quotient map, which we can write as something like this, uh, as a map R to R mod I, which takes each element little r to the element 5 little r, is simply defined to be its translate. And that we can easily see is, well, we, by, by just writing down what the addition is, it's clear that we've already checked that this map is, 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 uh, takes addition to addition, and it takes multiplication to multiplication, and so it is, in fact, a, a morphism of rings. Um, so we've already checked that. Um, so we have, a, we have a quotient ring and a quotient ring map that uh, puts the usual ring, pushes everything the usual ring down into this quotient. We've already more or less seen all this story applied in the simple case um, where we picked m an integer and we let i be the ideal generated by m. In other words, the multiples of that integers are our ring be the integers and i this, I this ideal. And then we already saw there was a quotient. Um, so r is the integers and it quotients down to r mod i is the integers modulo, while well, i is just multiples of the integers. And that was already our notation we used for integers modding out multiples of m. And so that, that's an example we've seen before in this quotient map we've already seen before. And, and I won't prove it, but uh, the commutativity of, uh, of, of these, this thing is, is pretty clear. So r mod i is a commutative uh, ring with 1, and the 1 is simply the 1 in R mod I, you could say, is simply defined to be the one in R plus translating uh, the I. It's fairly straightforward to see that that actually works as a as a as a, a an identity element over the multiplication. It, it's fairly abstract, um, but we can make it a little bit less abstract in in particular in the case of polynomials. Um, if we look at the example of um, let's say p of x y is uh, as an irreducible um, uh, non-constant polynomial uh, over a field K, over some field K, uh, then um, we'll let the ring be the ring of all um, of all polynomials in these two variables. And then, uh, and then we'll let the ideal be the ideal generated by a particular polynomial. Now, if we're going to get that polynomial to vanish, then all multiples of it will vanish. So if P of X, Y vanishes somewhere, everything in the ideal that it generates it vanishes as well. Because everything in this ideal is just multiples of this guy. So if this guy vanishes, all its multiples vanish and everybody vanishes. So that means that at every point of the associated curve, we let C be the, um, the curve P of X, Y equals 0. And again, with points defined not just over K, but of course defined with points defined over K bar um, over some algebraic closure of K. As we said before, we always wanted our algebra plane algebraic curves to have uh, points in them that come from the closure. Um, and then we, we know that that means that uh, these things vanish, this multiples of P of X, Y vanish. And, and in fact, that this is an irreducible curve also because we said there's an irreducible polynomial. Um, so we have these things vanish, and they're exactly the things that vanish. And so, in fact, the things in R map to the things in um, the functions, uh, the regular functions on the curve by taking every, well, the, again, R was all polynomials. We map every polynomial to its values on the curve, to, to it, it's thought of as a function on the curve, uh, on the k-bar points of the curve. And, um, and we found that the, 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 um, 
the kernel of this morphism was exactly this ideal. And so that means that this guy drops down to a, a map um, from here. We can take the quotient this way, and we can actually define the map this way. Um, and in fact, it actually becomes an isomorphism of, of rings um, from this guy, which is something I won't prove with you. Could more, we've more or less done it as an exercise. So, um, so it's not too hard to see that that's exactly what this thing is, that, um, that the regular functions are just exactly this quotient ring. So it gives us an example. We already have da calculated explicitly what these things look like, these regular functions. And, uh, and now we have this notion, much more abstract notion of constructing a quotient ring. But we actually find it's just this, uh, this is an example of, what we, of, of this more abstract general construction. So um, a trivial uh, lemma, a very elementary lemma, um, an ideal uh, I containing a ring R is all of R, when is it actually equal to R? Just exactly when, when um, one that belongs to uh, to the ideal, or you could say also just exactly when C belongs to the ideal for some uh, constant C, which is not equal to zero. And um, so that so that that's a test that we'll need to use. How do we determine if if uh, if an ideal is everything? Um, so um, and the proof is is fairly easy. That if one is in the ideal, well then and then r is in the ring, anything in the ring, then of course one times r must also be in the ideal. But that's equal to r. So every r in the ring belongs to the ideal. And so that gives us um, that uh, one in uh, in the ideal implies that r is the whole ideal, that the ideal is just everything. And the other direction is not so hard, so I'll leave you to, to work that out. Now, we're, we're not just interested in, in ideals, but also in, in those ideals which are somehow irreducible. We like the irreducible polynomials. Um, so how can we generalize that to all ideals? What we want to say is that our, our intuition for um, from working, our intuition from working with polynomials helps us to understand the more general case of general rings and ideals because we'll think of every commutative ring as something like polynomials and then every ideal is something like imposing an additional equation on those polynomials which cuts out something like like a plane algebraic curve. So, uh, so we really want to think about what would it mean for that curve to be reducible in a sort of general algebra terms. A curve, uh, an ideal is said to be prime if, um, uh, let's say, an ideal I containing a ring R is prime if i is not all of r and uh for any any uh a and b in r uh if sorry if um a b the product is in the ideal then uh a is in the ideal or b is in the ideal now this this is motivated by an obvious example the word prime should Give, give us the, the notion that um, we take r to be the integers and we take i to be the ideal generated by some integer so in multiples integer multiples of some m m some integer then um, we can ask when is i a prime ideal um, that means exactly that when when something ends up being a when we take some a and b in this r which is in the case in this case integers take two integers and you ask what if their product is in is in i uh, does that imply that that a or b uh, is in i one of them's in i in other words if a times b is a multiple of m that's exact this is exactly saying that um, it's exactly saying that if a times b is a multiple of m an integer multiple of m for a and b integers um, is it does that imply uh, that does that imply that uh, a or b one is also a multiple of m and clearly that's just exactly being prime that's exactly saying that m is a prime integer so we see therefore that that um, the ideal generated by m is a prime ideal um, in the ring of integers this is our ring um, is exactly the same as saying that um, uh, plus or minus m, whichever one turns out to be positive, uh, is a prime number. 
it's a prime integer. So I guess we could say absolute value m is a prime integer. It also allows for things like m being minus 3 instead of plus 3, but not very interesting. Basically, it's about being prime. So you know, we should have said here also absolute value um, is prime. Um, so, I mean, for example, 6 is 2 times 3, but 2 and 3, neither 2 nor 3 is a multiple of 6. So, um, but another example, which which is where things get a little bit uh, trickier, is to look at things like the ring of uh, integer coefficient polynomials in a single variable, one variable x. Then um, we can look at the ideal generated by x, and again, that's just all the um, the set of all polynomials in x with uh, zero constant term. And it's an ideal. It's a, not a trivial ideal. It's a serious example of an ideal, but it is prime. The reason is that, um, is that um, you can't factor x. So if, if you had some uh, b of x polynomial and some c of x polynomial uh, in i, that is to say a multiple of x, so b of x times c of x, uh, it has zero constant term. Um, that clearly implies that b of x or c of x has two, also zero constant term. So that's an example of a prime ideal among these. So it's sort of like saying that x is something like a prime number, but among polynomials in x rather than among numbers. And as an example of a non-prime ideal, let's let j in the same ring. Let's let I'll use j as the letter when I I've used, already used the letter i. Let's let j be two x. Then that's not a prime ideal in this ring because two is in j. Uh, it's, sorry, two is not in j, and x is not in j, but two x is in j. So, uh, so, so roughly speaking, it's 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 like not like a not a prime because it factors into non-trivial things. So J is not a prime ideal. Now this kind of example doesn't happen when we have fields because we can always scale a two to become a one. Um, so over uh, a field K, we ca we know that um, a P of X is irreducible. Uh, polynomial in any number of variables if and only if the ideal generated by it is prime because it did that is to say it doesn't factor um, because it factored then you'd be able to take put, get its factors to multiply together to get in there without either one already being in there so we want to have a sort of an intuition that um, in in the world of of abstract rings, we want to say that, that that a ring is is sort of something like, and this is a very imprecise, mathematically imprecise notion. I'm not trying to be, um, I, I'm not trying to be rigorous uh, in my mathematics, but a rough idea is that a ring is something like, um, like the regular functions, like the ring of regular functions on some geometric object cut out by some polynomial equation. And that's our intuition for what what all rings, or all community of rings, are sort of like. They're sort of like regular functions. Um, at, at least that's because it's simply all I'm really saying is that this is our favorite example of of how we come about with a, how we come up with an example of a ring. We like these rings. Um, these are somehow our favorites. And um, and an ideal inside there is like the equation of uh, of a geometric. Um, object inside that one, inside the given geometric object. So this ring is something like the regular functions on something or other. Um, and then the ideal is something, on a, an ideal, every ideal there, are, of course, in general, many, is something like drawing another object inside that one. So for example, in this surface, we've drawn a curve. And the equation of that curve generates an ideal as written. The equation can be written as somehow uh, wanting certain of the variables to vanish, we write some equation for the curve, and that gives uh, for the, for this curve on this surface, uh, and then that'll give us a um, an ideal which is generated by that uh, by that polynomial inside that ring. So the ring is supposed to be the functions on the functions on this guy, and the ideal this thing. We haven't really talked about surfaces or any of that, but it's intuitively clear more or less what we mean. And this is just supposed to be a rough outline of some ideas.
So then uh, prime ideal, that's really like being irreducible. And so that's like a, um, a, a geometric object, an equation of, a, of an irreducible object of an irreducible um, geometric object inside inside our given one. So this might be an example where it's just a circle. But if you had if you had one that's not irre, not, it's not irreducible, it might consist of, say, something here and something else here and something else here. And we can think of it as having three pieces that we pull apart, and each one of which we think of as being somehow given by a prime ideal. And the quotient ring, um, uh, the idea of a quotient ring uh, of a uh, of a of a ring by an ideal is basically, in roughly speaking, at least or at least for a prime ideal, let's say, so it's some irreducible object. It's something like thinking about the regular functions, regular functions on that uh, geometric uh, sub-object. Uh, so we have some geometric object like this kind of surface. On it, we have some curve cut out by some equation. The equation generates the, the polynomial that gives the equation generates some ideal, and the regular functions on that curve uh, themselves are are also a ring, and that's our quotient ring. Um, it's it's convenient in think this is only a rough intuitive notion, but it's convenient in thinking about it this way to note that one of the ways in which we found uh, objects that were you know, that were not irreducible that were reducing was that if we found that there there was some kind of equation of this guy, say this is like maybe y equals x, and then this guy uh, was something like y equals zero, um, the union of the two lines is not irreducible. It's made out of two individual irreducible lines. Um, so the geometric object consisting of those two lines is not irreducible. Um, and that's because it has uh, two parts cut up by two equations. And on this one, y minus x is a function which is 0. And this one, y is 0. And uh, so on the, on the whole thing, we can say the product of those y times y minus x would have to be 0 on both. Um, and so that would be something that belonged to the ideal of, uh, here. Uh, so this is y equals x equals 0. This equation holds here, this equation holds here, and this equation holds on both. And so you have an equation that splits into two factors. Um, and so it's, uh, so if you think of the ideal generated by y, y minus x contained in k of x, y, um, uh, so again, this should be an example, um, then uh, this guy splits uh, y and y minus x are both not in the ideal, but their product is and that's because the equation of one piece and the equation of the other piece are independently not in the ideal. They don't vanish on both pieces. Uh, the ideal is the stuff that vanishes on both both of the irreducible components. Um, but their product does vanish on on because one vanishes on one component, the other vanishes on the other, and there are only two components that put them both together, and you get something that vanishes on everything. And so that's an example where it's where it's not where you find an ideal is not prime because it because it consists of an irreducible of a reducible object could be reduced into two objects. And so we have the the uh, um, elementary observation, which I won't uh, I won't prove that an ideal in a ring again commutative ring with one uh, is prime. Um, if and only if uh, the quotient ring R mod I has no zero divisors. And what's a zero divisor? This is an example where we're in the quotient. We'd quotient that out, the y times y minus x. But we wouldn't quotient out the y. We wouldn't quotient out the y minus x. So uh, the, a, a zero divisor should mean that alpha beta is zero bought in the quotient ring. But alpha is not zero. And beta is also not zero, also in the quotient ring. So we take objects in the quotient ring. I'll leave you to to to, to prove that it's uh, it's not difficult to prove from the definition of of a of a prime ideal. One thing we're missing in this picture, uh, thinking about about geometric objects as being sort of cut out by equations, ideals being something like that like, like representing equations of, of geometric objects. So the uh, the the geometric object, which is this pair of lines, is cut out by setting these this thing to zero by this equation. We take the equation and make the ideal it generates, and that the the, the elements of that ideal will all vanish on this thing. Um, so that picture doesn't give rise to what is a point then? A, a, what's a natural notion of it? what's what's a point? We've talked about geometric objects, but how do we decide which geometric objects are supposed to be represented as curves, which are surfaces, and which are thought of as points?
Um, for this purpose, we want to say that it's a geometric object it doesn't contain any smaller ones. So if you add any more equations, you go you get nothing. You don't get any solutions at all. So uh, we can say that an ideal is maximal. It's all the equations you can put in without running out of things to do. Um, uh, in in a, well, so an ideal i is maximal in a ring R. Again, commutative with identity. If there are no no ideals, um, J with I contained in not equal to J contained in not equal to R. This is a bit confusing. It's a bit dangerous. Um, the danger is that you might think, well, R is an ideal in R, and that's true according to our definition of ideal. So R should be the maximal ideal in R because it's the biggest thing you can possibly get. Um, so the word maximal here is really maximal subject to not being equal to R. Um, that's uh, it's always called maximal. We just say maximal, but we really mean maximal except not equal to R. Um, and then um, we want to say that this is the analog of, of the equations of a point. So if we think of our ring as something like polynomials or regular functions on some surface or something, then um, uh, I is supposed to cut out something smaller. J is supposed to cut out something in the middle. And the bigger the the, the more equations you have the, that you impose with your ideal, the smaller the geometric object is that satisfies them all. And so if I is maximal, if there's nothing larger, uh, no larger collection of, of non-trivial equations, that means we should be down to uh, the smallest set of solutions we can get. So that should be something like a point. Um, and uh, I won't prove it, but I can leave it for you to check that uh, if C is a plane algebraic curve, um, and uh, over K, let, let's just say algebraically closed for simplicity, um, then uh, I contained in K of some ideal uh, is is maximal exactly when uh, I is the ideal of um, regular functions on C vanishing at some point at some point P naught and C. So, uh, so, so it corresponds to a point. It's the collection of equations you get to cut out some point. But that leads us to the perverse situation. Now that we now that we have an abstract definition of something of a maximal ideal, which we think of as being so many equations that you've that you've added, you couldn't add any more. So it's something like cutting out the tiniest thing you could cut out. So something like a point. We have now reached the weird point where we can say, okay, that was where we got our intuition from. But the idea works for any ideal inside any ring. We can ask whether or not it's maximal. For any ring, we can go ahead and compute out what its maximal ideals are. And those are something like points in some kind of geometric structure that we think of as, as, as a geometry of, associated to this ring. Um, let's just find some simple examples. Um, so we've already uh, found that the prime ideals in Z were exactly um, the the, multi, the the ideals generated by prime numbers. Um, the prime ideals in Z are exactly the, the the prime the multiples of prime numbers, or you could write them as PZs. Um, so there, those are these these guys. But but it's easy to check that they're all maximal. Um, they're all maximal. Um, so those are in fact the maximal ideals. So the maximal ideals correspond to prime numbers. So this is a, a sense in which for the integer something rather uh, unusual happens, something rather special happens where all the maximal ideals, uh, oh, sorry, all the prime ideals are maximal. Um, uh, so it's easy to check that maximal implies prime uh, for any ring, any commutative ring with identity, but the other way around doesn't always work. Um, and it does in the case of the integers, which is rather special. Connecting up all of our all of our work so far is the uh, important observation that um, uh, that an ideal contained in a commutative ring with identity I won't write it all out. This is again ideal is a commutative ring with identity um, that I our ideal is maximal if and only if um, the quotient R mod I is a field, and this it ties everything together because we've done all this abstract ring theory to construct lots of interesting rings, and we've also been interested in fields and field extensions. So now we're able to construct lots of interesting fields out of those rings. So to relate the two the two issues, so um, so a proof of this um, is actually very elementary, um, very straightforward. Suppose uh, suppose I is maximal. <coughs> 
Um, suppose that I is maximal and we'll try and prove we get a field. We take some alpha non-zero in the quotient ring. That alpha is, of course, some, some translate a plus i, some a in the ring. Um, now what we want to do uh, is to use the fact that i is maximal. But um, it's not hard to check that the ideal generated by a plus i is, all, is also an ideal. Let's call it j. Is, set up, is defined to be this guy, and also that, of course, I is contained in it, and it's contained in R. But, um, but it's got A in it, and so if this, is, this guy is non-zero, uh, this is a non-zero element of the quotient ring, it must come from a non-zero element of, uh, of the, uh, it must have a non-zero element, A here. In fact, that A must not be in I, okay? Uh, a is not in I, because if A was in I, this would be 0. This would be 0 plus I. And so um, so we could just uh, say uh, right away that alpha is non-zero exactly means A is not in I. And then, therefore, this guy, when you take this ideal, uh, it can't be this and this end. Um, uh, it can't be that because uh, it's bigger. It's got A in it. This ideal has A in it. So... Um, is generated by it's got sums of things like with multiples of a and, and things from i, so it's uh, it's bigger than i, and therefore because i is maximal, it must be j must be equal to r, um, and so uh, so what we get is that everything in r can be written like this. So in particular, it means that since everything since this is r, everything in r looks like this, and so one looks like this, it looks like some multiple of a plus something in our ideal, some b in the ring, and some i in the ideal. And now it's easy to check that, in fact, uh, b, let's let beta be b plus i, and we can check, which I'll leave you to do, that alpha beta is 1 in this ring, in this quotient ring. So that shows that the quotient ring is a field because we constructed a reciprocal. That's all we have to do. It's already a community for ring with identity, but we showed non-zero elements always have reciprocals. It's a bit abstract how they come about. They come about because there exists some, some expression, which is not very constructive, so it is quite abstract. And then we want to go the other way. If we prove the, the result, if i is maximal, then we get a field. The other direction is, what if r mod i is a field? We'll assume that and try and work out the other direction that i is maximal. So we take any element a in r, which is not in i, an element of r minus r i, little uh, black slash here, meaning uh, a is in r, not in i. So a is in r, a is not in i. Take Since uh, we want to ask whether or not this guy is maximal, if it fails to be maximal, we could always find something somewhat bigger. So we could always find something in here. And then um, take a reciprocal of a plus i, that's in our ring, and it has a reciprocal, uh, so let's call it b plus i. Um, so that means that a b plus i equals 1 plus i. So therefore, a b minus 1 uh, plus i equals i. Or in other words, a b minus 1 is in i. And so we can write a, b minus 1 is some element of i. And therefore, the ideal a, again, you have to check this is an ideal. I'm not doing all the details. Uh, this ideal, let's say j, is defined to be a plus i, um, contains, um, well, you can take b and multiply a by it, and you get something else in there. And this guy is in here, which is 1 plus i, which is 1 in the quotient ring. So it contains this element, plus i, well, in the in one in the quotient ring. Um, so this ideal uh, is going to contain all this stuff. Um, and uh, so it's going to have to therefore equal, um, uh, therefore j has to equal r because it contains 1. And um, and so, therefore, any ideal which is even a little bit larger than i would have to contain something not an i, as it can contain all the multiples of that because it has to be an ideal, and therefore it has to, and it has to because there's some, so it has to contain this. So, if there was some some way to construct some ideal uh, in the middle, then uh, j, uh, if we take anything in a, which is any a and j with a not an i, if there's anything in here, then of course j would have to contain.
a plus i. So it contain i, it has to contain a, it contains every multiple of a, it contains some, so it have to contain that. So that's the proof that i is maximal. So now let's see some examples of, of this, this result that we, we can make these fields. We can make, so we've said we can make lots of fields by just trying to find maximal ideals. Uh, we can build fields. So let's start off with our favorite example, which is the integers. And we said that the maximal ideals uh, were exactly uh, the multiples of primes. So P times Z, P, well, P prime. Uh, and we can assume positive, right? It's a positive prime integers. And um, and what fields do we get when we quotient out? Well, we just get exactly the ring. Well, R mod I is exactly the ring is Z, and the ideal is PZ. And so we already have seen all those fields before. So the fields we get are the ones we we've, we've sort of expect been expecting. Um, on the other hand, we could construct if we have K as a field, and um, and let's let R be the polynomials in one variable over that over that field. Then let's take um, any ideal in here. We know that we can replace uh, any ideal. We've already said before, when you have a whole bunch of polynomials, you can take their GCD, even an infinite set of polynomials. And so it's always generated by a single polynomial, which is its GCD of the whole collection. So you can always take a GCD polynomial for the whole collection, and it's just generated by its GCD. So, so in other words, every ideal is just generated by a single polynomial. And, um, and we've discovered that i is prime exactly when uh, p of x is irreducible. But, um, but that's exactly the same as saying that i is maximal. Why? Because, well, we said that maximal implied prime, this is always the case for any ideal in any commutative ring. We said maximal implies prime. I didn't prove it. I'll leave you to check it. Um, but prime in this case implies maximal because it's generated by this irreducible element. So we can check that you can't get in there by a product of some, you'd have some say b of x, c of x uh, in the multiples of p of x, some multiple of p of x. Um, then one of them, because it's irreducible, one of them has to already be in there. We said that was the property of irreducibility. So, um, so that makes it maximal. And so, as we've already checked, this is again an example we've already done. This R mod I in this example is R is, is the, all the polynomials. And then the ideal is the ideal generated by this polynomial. And this is how we constructed adjoining a root. We adjoined a root to a polynomial by creating an abstract variable and quotienting out the polynomial so that now when that, the variable is now called, um, we let alpha be x mod p of x was our general technique. And then this guy was called k of alpha. And we checked that it was a field. So this is one we've actually already done before. We want to use this abstract notion of quotient ring to solve some problems that we've been worried about before. Um, we're particularly interested in finding lots of automorphisms of uh, splitting fields. We want to say that automorphisms are not very rare when we split uh, a polynomial. So the first thing we need to know is that, um, suppose we have k is a field and p of x is a polynomial in k of x, um, and it's not constant. Then we want to claim that any two uh, splitting fields, this is something we said before, but we didn't prove it, any two splitting fields of p of x are isomorphic. They're the same, essentially. Um, by an isomorphism which is the identity on, on uh, k. So uh, let's try and figure out what would the proof be. Start off with just one splitting field. The capital K be one splitting field, and um, alpha in capital K a root of our P of X. Let's start at the simplest case. Uh, we'll suppose P of X is irreducible. Suppose P of X is irreducible, and then we'll worry about non-irreducible, about reducible later.
So then, uh, then what I want to do is I want to define a morphism of rings, which is simply I take all the polynomials and I map them to this field by taking x, uh, and mapping it to alpha, which is a root of p of x, and then mapping every polynomial, every polynomial in x, uh, we we just take its value, we map it to q of alpha. So this is my map. It takes x to alpha, and then from there on takes all polynomials x to the associated polynomials in alpha. And we've already seen that that's a, that's a morphism of rings. But we've also seen that uh, that its kernel, that the things that it kills, uh, is exactly uh, its kernel uh, i contained in k of x is exactly i is the multiples of p of x. Those are the things that go to zero when you when you turn x into a root of p of x, you turn p of x into zero. And because it's irreducible, you don't do anything else. You do some essentially no other damage to anything else. And so what we end up with is that uh, is a map that takes this guy to this guy onto uh, its onto map. And its kernel is exactly this. And then I'll leave you to check that if you take the the if you quotient by the kernel of a ring morphism, we've already had that as an exercise, um, if you quotient by the kernel of a ring morphism, you get it's uh, yeah that's an exercise somewhere in the in the notes that you get an odd, an odd isomorphism. This is an isomorphism. So uh, so this concretely given well sort of given in the in the theorem statement of the theorem field is actually uh, isomorphic to this more abstract construction of putting all the polynomials and quotienting out. So that's again just the abstract k of x modulo p of x. And that implies the uniqueness because if you had a different choice of splitting field for the irreducible, um, yours would be, I have such an isomorphism and mine would have such an isomorphism. So you could take uh, mine, go backwards to the isomorphism, and then go forwards to your isomorphism, and then we get an isomorphism between them. Now, the, the, the trickier case is what if it's not irreducible? So it's reducible. Um, then what you do is you take a factor, uh, q of x, of p of x, which we can assume is irreducible. So split off an irreducible factor, and then we'll take uh, two splitting fields, k and l, so yours and mine, splitting fields of this p of x. Each of them has to split p of x. It has to split all the factors. It has to split q of x. And so, um, so I have an alpha in k and a beta in l, uh, which are uh, roots of p of x. No, sorry, roots at roots of q of x. It has to have these roots. Um, and so the, uh, the, the, the subfields generated, k of alpha contained in your field, and k of beta contained in my field, must be isomorphic by the previous result for irreducible. Um, for irreducibles, we already had this result that if it was irreducible, which Q is, uh, then 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 these must be isomorphic, um, and so we can identify them. Now that's a bit of a weird thing to say. Um, there's this map that it, that takes each one of these to one of these a dictionary exactly saying what to identify, what to glue to what. So we glue them together abstractly, and we'll treat them as being the same. So from now on, they're exactly, they're not just isomorphic, but they're exactly the same. And so we can assume alpha is beta, because we can just glue together whatever's in this one with whatever's in that one by this isomorphism. So now we have to deal with the rest of the problem. Um, but now, uh, now what we have, instead of this k, k now sits in some larger k of alpha, which sits in your field, but also sits in my field. And so we've, by one step, gone up. To, from k to k of alpha, and we're now back to the problem we started with, but now we only have to worry about p of x modulo uh, q of x, or, or I'm sorry, divided by q of x. We can divide out all the copies of q of x. It may divide them several times, actually, but we can divide it out uh, and get a lower degree polynomial. Uh, we get a lower degree polynomial. We divide it as many times as it goes in, and we're left over with with a lower degree problem. And so, by induction, we can do it. The induction of degree, and and this leads to um, to a, a, a the basic fact that we have large uh, large automorphism groups. Suppose that k is an extension of little k, and it's a splitting field um, of some polynomial of let's say an irreducible. Uh, polynomial p of x, and suppose that alpha and beta are uh, in k, 
and they're both roots of that same p of x, then um, there, there, there is a some automorphism um, of k, which is the identity fixes all the elements of little k, which swaps those roots. So you can swap them. In other words, there's lots of automorphisms because if you pick these two different choices, you can swap them one to the other. In particular, uh, that immediately tells us that k over k is in fact a Galois extension. And, and the proof is actually um, uh, completely trivial at this point. Uh, we know that if, uh, if we take alpha in this k, we can map to it from an abstract k of x modulo some ideal. But if we take beta in k, we can also map to it using this from this guy. And then uh, we get that these are isomorphisms of fields. And so if instead of going uh, this way and this way, what we do is we go from an element here, we ask, what, what does this automorphism give you if you go backwards through it and then go along this automorphism over here and we get an automorphism because com composition of an automorph of automorphism is an automorphism and the inverse of an automorphism is an automorphism. In this lecture we talked about a geometric description of or geometric way of thinking about rings and ideals as terms of polynomial equations. Of course it wasn't precise or rigorous. We'd like to be able to have a similar picture for field extensions and that's what we'll worry about next time.